how's it going? Welcome to the Monday weekly review video where I take questions from last week's videos and answer them for you. And I don't really have any other extra business to talk about this week, so I'm just gonna get right into the first video that we posted and it was titled, I Accidentally Bought Too Many Plants. And it was just a vlog where I showed you guys um, me planting a bunch of fall annuals that were beautiful. I had planned on doing a huge display of fall color up in the front of our house where the truffula pink gonfrina is planted, but the gonfrina was still going strong and I just felt like it was getting too late in the season I needed to get the plants in the ground so that we can enjoy them um, so the first question was from Danny Scheid I had no idea there was a harvest guard protector for plants does it really work better than using good old bed sheets um, so I brought a piece of harvest guard out this is a very well-loved piece this is what it is right here like you can see through it it's very lightweight um, so it's lighter weight actually than a bed sheet and bed sheets work great to protect anything from a frost or um, that sort of thing um, or from heat I use this on my tomato plant after I cut it back really hard um, when it was really hot out and it helps out a lot because it still lets light in it lets light through but it, not as much um, as if it was just exposed completely and then it protects things from frost but it also lets a little bit of moisture go through too so it doesn't get really heavy um, so you can get this in a whole bunch of different sizes I don't even know what size this is I use it on the base uh, at the base of boxwoods too when I'm trimming them so I'll just kind of pull this around the base of whatever I'm trimming do my trimming and then I can gather it all up and do my cleanup really really quickly and I like to use this because it's just very lightweight Paula's allotment uh, asked how long will the mums last into winter I've never planted them before you know it totally depends on the fall I typically don't do a lot of mums just because uh, in the landscape when they're planted like I did in this video they last I think to me it seems like they last a lot longer than they do in containers mums and containers like they have a couple good weeks and then they start to like flush out and then when you deadhead them it, deadheading is a total pain they don't ever really look as good as they did in that first flush of bloom so I tend to stay away from them in containers just because I want my containers to last a little bit longer in the landscape they seem to have a lot longer of a bloom time I don't know if it's just they're better acclimated um, they are getting what they need exactly um, so those mums that I planted the white ones are almost fully open and they're looking gorgeous right now and I think they'll last into November and then I do plan on I don't know if this was a question I haven't read through them yet um, I don't, I'm going to move those mums probably to the west side because they are perennial here um, so we can enjoy them for more years Jessica asks are you planning on leaving the mums in there since they are perennial yep so there's that question I thought I'd read that somewhere um, I am Ziano just wondering if you could eat those ornamental cabbages. It'd be great to have some Osaka pink coleslaw as a side dish. Um, the kale I planted is definitely an edible. I think the the cabbage, I don't know for sure. I'm pretty sure you can probably eat it if you want to. I don't know if the flavor is as good. Um, I don't know, don't take my advice on that. Do your research. Um, but yeah, that would be kind of a pretty side dish. Bonnie uh, says, I've had a gardener rip out in the large beds at two of my homes. Uh, thank you for your wonderful videos. Can you confirm that you don't pull up your bulbs out of the ground each winter? I do not because almost all the bulbs, well, all the bulbs I put in in the fall are perennial here. So we garden in a zone five and bulbs need a specific amount of weeks of cold. So it's called a vernalization period in order to get enough energy uh, to bloom the next season. And so here in zone five, they get that. And a lot of times, you know, all my tulips and daffodils and alliums all those things come back every year some varieties better than others like daffodils are super strong um, naturalizing type of bulbs tulips most of them come back really strong some of them don't as much I know in a warmer climate they're treated more as an annual and people pull them out and plant them fresh every year which oh my word I'm so glad I don't have to do that it's a lot of work Sandra when you plant your mums did you use any biotone starter or fertilizer I did not, I completely forgot to put any fertilizer in my cart for that video, so none of those plants got any. Um, they're all doing pretty well and usually plants and containers that you get from a garden center have fertilizer already like a slow release put on the top so they're probably okay um, I will however plant them with biotone when I dig them out in the spring and move them good and delicious says can I ask an honest question why has cheddar been so embraced but no which is the black and white kitty that comes around occasionally hasn't I mean uh, the name no isn't exactly very embracing so just really quick we do have a lot of people a lot of comments or questions about uh, where no is he still comes and goes I think it's a he I don't even know it's a wild cat uh, he showed up when Benjamin was brand new baby and I was up feeding 
Benjamin and would hear this like mournful no sound coming from outside. It freaked me out at first before I realized it was a cat. Um, so he got the name no from that because he would just sit out there and just like mournfully cry but he won't let anybody get close to him i can get i've touched his face before and then he freaks out and kind of runs off but i feed him he comes you know whenever he wants on the other hand cheddar showed up and just immediately wanted to rub on all of our legs and he would roll around on his back and he loves benjamin so you know of course because cheddar is a little bit more warm and uh, people friendly he got like kind of welcomed in and no would as well if no would kind of snap out of his wild ways next video is harvesting parsnips for the first time uh karen said did you take a picture of the parsnip sweethearts i did we'll put it on the screen ruby i wonder if you should have tasted only a few before pulling all of them out i thought about that after i got done i got so excited pulling out all those parsnips like that for me like any kind of root crop carrots potatoes garlic onions like it is so much fun to dig those kind of crops because you don't truly know what you've got going on under, underneath that soil until you dig them up. And since this was my first time pulling parsnips or digging up parsnips, I got excited and pulled them all up. But it would have probably been a good idea to taste a couple, see if they had gathered enough sugar and if they were sweet enough. Um, that way I would have known to leave them in the ground longer. Um, MCW says, I can't believe you don't eat soups and stews with all the produce you grew, uh, you grow. So that was like, I asked for parsnip recipes um, because usually I only roast them. We don't eat a lot of soups and stews because honestly Aaron doesn't like soup and stews. He wants to be able to, if it's a soup, he wants to be able to eat it with a fork. Um, so anytime I make something like that, it's got to be like super hearty and super thick and big pieces. Um, so I just naturally don't make as many, but there were a ton of good recipes. So thank you so much, all of you who left those in the comment section. Uh, v you need a fork uh yes i have a garden fork love uh could you leave some plants in the ground and just pull them as you need them yes i actually had a comment from a gal who lives about 40 minutes away from me um she comes into the garden center all the time and we've known the family forever but she said that her parents even like for 60 plus years have grown parsnips and what they do is they just mulch them up really high and they're actually slightly colder than we are here where they live and they just mulch them up high and then just dig them as they want to use them so that's something I'll probably do in the future next video is three things I do with annual grasses at the end of the season and I just showed three things that I typically do with annual grasses so the first thing was to cut them down and get rid of them um, and that's a pretty obvious one the second thing is to leave them if they're small enough because they look absolutely gorgeous with frost and a little light layer of snow and they're really not that big of a pain to clean up in the spring as so long as they're not like a huge grass that flops over and then the third thing I did was I cut one of my grasses out of a container along our fence line out of Aaron and my competition containers because it had like the most gorgeous shape and I didn't really want to just see it go so I tied it together cut it off and then just plunk the whole thing down in an, a rate like an urn or a vase and then put limelight hydrangeas around the, the bottom of it and it's so beautiful like every once in a while you do something that's easy and you're like dang <laughs> I should do this every single and it's something that I have done in the past but the limelight hydrangeas was like the extra oomph that made that arrangement amazing um, and I kind of wish that all the things like all the ideas and all of the projects that I did around here turned out like that and were that easy uh, but Shelly said that a sealer that is also a fixative is used on art drawings to keep like charcoal and chalk pastels affixed to the paper, which makes total sense. And the only thing I had on hand was this can of sealer. I was looking and hoping that I had a can of spray adhesive to keep help keep the grass seeds attached um, so that's something I need to go get so far the grass is doing great with that sealer spray um, I have since moved to inside it's sitting in our landing on a table um, underneath a chandelier and it looks beautiful um, so it's not really getting into the elements we had a couple of really rainy days and that would destroy that arrangement really quick so I moved it inside um, but I'll probably watch it and then spray it with a spray adhesive that's like proper uh, later on if I need to Angelia and Angelia Angelia, Jala. If you left the root ball, would they come back next year? Um, all of those grasses are annual here because we're too cold. Most of them are like a zone 9, 10, or 11, I think. 
Um, and so the second we get a frost, like a hard frost, most of those grasses will go. Monica asked, do you overwinter the root ball of the grasses? Would they come back in the spring if you did? I have tried. I've tried numerous times. When I worked down at the garden center, um, I would bring in any leftover grasses that we didn't sell. I'd bring them into the sunroom. I tried to winter them over that way. I tried to winter them over in a, like a little bit um, of a colder area, like a cold frame. I never had any success wintering them over here. Uh, Kellen says, all I could really think about while you were tying up those grasses was bugs. How do you prepare mentally knowing how many bugs must be awaiting you inside all that grass? It is something that doesn't ever cross my mind. I don't really have a fear of bugs. I mean, of course, I don't want them on me. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't want them crawling on me, uh, but it's not something I think about when I go in and tackle a project. We don't have like horrible bugs here. Like I know some of you guys, like if you live in an area where you have scorpions or like huge spiders, tarantulas, uh, that would freak me out. I wouldn't like that so much, but here it's pretty benign. Katie asked, would Wilt Stop do the same thing to preserve an arrangement like this? It might. The, the thing I was using that spray for, we're back to the spray sealer, was just to affix the seed heads. Because it's a dry arrangement, Wilt Stop I think is more for keeping moisture in things a little bit longer. Like I used it on a lot of my evergreen arrangements for like the last Christmas season. Outside I used them on um, like pine and spruce and I think I had cypress and some arborvita in containers. And it was the first time ever that, especially like the softer evergreen, the cypress and the arborvitas tend to dry out the quickest in those type of arrangements. When I cleaned those pots out in February, they were still soft and pliable. So I really think the wilt stop works great in that application. Okay, next video is decorating our outdoor fireplace for fall. And this is just a video I cobbled together a bunch of stuff from around our house. I bought a few pumpkins and I just put together a kind of a cozy area around our fireplace because it's really the only area we use outside once it gets cold because we can make it warmer with the fire. Laura, I have a question for you. Do the plants around the fireplace burn from the heat coming off the fireplace? I was worried about that at first, so I did like a bunch of tests, especially the boxwoods that are sitting on the mantle. The rocks around that fireplace do not get hot. It's the weirdest thing. Um, it drafts really well, so all the smoke and a lot of the like heat is pulled up I think through the chimney and it goes out um, but like the surrounding area of course like the stuff right on the table in front of the fire we remove that when we do a fire um, in that area because of course that gets really hot uh, but that's easy I only had two things I need to remove the big grass arrangement obviously <laughs> don't want that in front of a fire and then there was one dusty miller in a container that we would just move to the side uh, everything else like to the sides of the fireplace and on top are totally fine uh, Jennifer says that she has a hard time finding dichondra this time of year because I used a Silver Falls dichondra in one of the little pots. Um, is it something that your parents carry year round? It's an annual plant so they don't have it year round but they sure do a good job keeping a really nice variety of things through the late fall. Um, because my mom and I in particular love to do projects all the time. It's just, it, it seems more of a natural, like she wants to keep things really well stocked so that we, we have things like supplies to use all the time. So it's a really good resource for me. And I wish, um, I know not all garden centers want to do that or can do that, um, but I wish that um, more would carry just a little bit more stuff in the fall. Uh, my favorite is the s'mores display. Love it when you romance the ordinary. Are you moving these plants indoor when it'll start snowing? So most of them, other than the dry grass arrangement, which has been moved all already are pretty cold tolerant plants like like the dichondra will probably not make it through the winter the dusty miller though the grasses the cabbage um, the hookahs all of those things are super cold tolerant the hookahs are an, um, semi evergreen perennial here so those will live um, everything else in the boxwoods the boxwoods will live they've been out there for a couple of years already but all of them I just try to use stuff that can really handle a lot Julie says I was curious as to what trees are planted around your sitting area and do they lose their leaves? Are the trees the only protection you have there or is there a patio cover or pergola? So the trees are the only thing. There are three things that kind of come together and create a canopy over the top of that area. There's an Eastern Redbud, there's an old lilac, and then a locust tree. Oh, and then a viburnum that gets quite large and it kind of creates a little bit of a barrier. Even when the leaves fall, in that area, it still feels cozy because there's enough structure around you, but there really isn't any protection from rain. I mean, that area will get rained on. Of course, not as much when the trees are full of leaves, um, but and it'll get snow and such. So that's why we cover all of our furniture right there so that we can just still use that area. Everything stays dry. Um, so yeah. 
Shelly says, have you used fabric tablecloths outside before? Do you have any problems with the tablecloths getting moldy? Do you cover the tables too? So I do not cover the tables. Um, I use fabric tablecloths outside. We're typically really dry here, so I've never dealt with anything molding, but I won't leave those out probably for the entire winter. I also only use cheap stuff. Like the linen tablecloth, I took that inside because that was a gift from my sister. It looked beautiful there. I left it there for several days and we enjoyed it there, but I moved that inside. It when we have another event or have other people over, I'll probably bring it back out. The little side tables I put the fabric on, that fabric I got for really cheap. Um, and that's typically the stuff I'll use outside because I don't mind if something happens to it or if it gets dirty and that way I don't have to stress. Amy says, did you ever open the Thunder Egg? I've been wondering what is inside it forever. So have I, and we still haven't opened it up. It's still sitting right in the same area. We should do that this winter. We totally should. Yeah, and we'll add that to the list. Um, have you ever thought about power washing your fireplace? I'd watch that video. I'm afraid that would make our fireplace fall apart. It would probably be pretty satisfying because I'm sure it's never been power washed or really cleaned. Like I'll, I'll brush it off with a broom if there's some um, spider webs, so I don't even think I've ever hosed it off. It's probably pretty gross. The very last video, I did a couple of different things. I showed you guys um, where I was trying to, I set a live trap because I was trying to catch whatever was trying to dig underneath the door to the run of our chicken coop. Um, and it was a skunk, we figured that out. But I was laying in bed that night thinking, okay, so what other things can I do to this area to try to create a really strong aversion? And I forgot I had some repellent in the barn. So I grabbed it so I could show you. This is called repels all animal repellent granules uh, this is from bonide and so it says to put a band six to eight inches wide around next to and around the area you wish to protect so i went out really late or i guess really early in the morning and i did that around the entire run and i haven't seen the skunk back since so i'm really hoping like i think that this is working really well and i can't smell it it doesn't smell to me uh, which is nice and i always kind of uh, like worry about that with repellents but this is the same repellent that i used out in the garden center i created one time a uh, sand zen like i was doing a zen sand garden display and then i thought well that was great i just created a huge litter box for all the feral cats so i started putting this repels all i never had a cat use that sandbox once um so i'm like pretty sold on it uh, Warp9P65 said, I've had a terrible time with raccoon skunks and possums trying to get my chickens. I've caught seven raccoons in a live trap this summer and one skunk. Here's a tip to keep the cats from going in the trap. Bait it with marshmallows. I have marshmallows. Varmints will go for them, but the cats ignore them. Worked great for me. I am going to do that. Because dang, dang it, Cheddar, he, like is drawn to that trap whenever I put food in it. Doesn't matter what kind of food. It can be dry cat food, tuna fish, whatever. He just wants all the food. I will try marshmallows. Thank you for that tip. Garden Obsessions. Is a skunk going after the eggs or chickens? We hear the foxes fighting here behind our house in the forest and they sound like a screaming man. Weirdest sound ever. That would freak me out. Um, so I've heard that they're just really after the eggs, but the, where the eggs are, well, I usually gather all the eggs, so they wouldn't find them, but it's really close to where the chickens are. I don't know. I just don't want to risk anything. I do shut the chickens into the coop at night. So it's not like if the skunk got in that they, it, like anything would ever happen, but I just don't want it to become a habit. Uh, DJ said skunks are nocturnal and are bland, blinded by light. Maybe a motion light nearby might help. Um, and that is something that we really should do. I thought about that motion activated sprinkler as well. I heard that those work, but right now we're getting so cold that I don't think I could actually run water out there. Um, I think we would deal with some freezing issues. And then Sandra said, be sure and tie a very long string to the door of the trap. <laughs> that way, if you catch a skunk, you can release it from a safe distance. Learn this the hard way. Oh, dang it. <laughs> See, that's what I was afraid of. This trap has one door on the front. So you catch a skunk and you get like a tarp or a, a sheet or a towel or whatever draped over the cage so it can't see you, which typically I hear they don't spray if they can't see you. Um, but then what do you do when you have to open the door? Like I have to put my hand in there to release that door. So the string is a very good idea. So that's it for this week's video, you guys. Thank you so much for all the comments and questions that you've left and suggestions. They're all so very helpful, probably not just to me, but to everybody else who reads them. It's really nice to know like personal experience and how everybody else has dealt with some of the same things that we're doing. So anyway, hope this video was helpful. Have a wonderful week and we will see you in the next one. Bye.